Hello, welcome to Backyard Compost Basics. Um, I'm my name is Cassandra Hemingway, and we are getting ready to get started. I will introduce the three of us who will be um, presenting today, and then we will start talking about compost. Um, so, Backyard Compost Basics is the first in our sustainability series. Um, this series of this virtual series of webinars and workshops has been funded by a grant from the United States Rural uh, Department of Agriculture Rural, Rural Utility Service um, to, to whom we're very grateful for the grant funding. Um, and this is the first one. We, we actually do offer this. We'll be offering this again later in the year and you'll get a recording of it afterward. Um, so my name is Cassandra Hemingway. I am the outreach manager at the Central Vermont Solid Waste Management District and um, here with me today is Theron Laysleeper. He'll be co-presenting. And he's also uh, a key member of the outreach team at the district. And Amanda Clement is our Eco AmeriCorps member, um, who's also a key member of the outreach team. And she's going to be our question master today. Amanda will be um, paying attention to the Q&A box. Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that, but there is a place where you can write your questions um, and we'll be taking a break a couple times throughout the webinar to answer questions and then we'll save some time at the end for a longer Q&A session. Um, do you both want to say hi before we get started? Sure. I'll start. My name is Theron. I'm the outreach coordinator at the district and uh, I've been composting as long as I can remember. At, uh, growing up we always composted but since I've been working with the district, I've, I've learned a lot about it. There's more to know about composting than I ever thought was possible. So happy to share some of that with you all today. Hi, I'm Amanda Clement. I am the Eagle AmeriCorps member for the district this year. I have a fairly basic knowledge of composting, did a little composting growing up, but there's definitely always more to learn and I'm still learning now too. And I'm just gonna ask that people try to put their questions in the Q&A box instead of the chat box and I might gently guide you towards there during the webinar if I'm not seeing that. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I think we're ready to get started. Um, I'll just introduce my experience as well. Also a lifelong composter. And um, the three of us have all completed the UVM Master Composter course. Um, and we teach a lot of composting workshops. We set up community composting sites. And um, Theron has developed a, a, a two-bin compost system that we're gonna talk about a little later in the webinar. Um, so we, between the three of us, we have some good experience. And if we don't know anything you ask about, we will um, we'll find out and get back to you later. Um, so let's get started. I'll go over what we're gonna talk about today and a quick overview about how food scraps are managed in Vermont. And then Theron's gonna take over for the next section. Um, so we are going to talk about why do we compost? What's that about? Um, what is compost? So we really literally go into what it's made up of. And that's important because if you understand what compost is, then you'll understand what you need to do to make it happen. Um, and then we spend quite a bit of time in the middle of the webinar going over a variety of compost systems um, to help you figure out you know, which system works for you. There's a bunch of different ways people manage their food scraps in their backyard. And whether you're already composting or you're getting started, um, you might wanna change your system or you might wanna start with something that works for you. So we'll talk about how each of them work. Um, and then Theron will take some time to go through what really, like what proportions of materials should go in your bin. And then we finish the webinar with the thing that everybody, asks about up front and that's animals. We talk about how to keep it up um, so that you reduce smells and keep animals uninterested and out of your bin. Um, so I see some questions already coming in. We're gonna take a break after Theron's section and we'll answer a couple questions um, throughout. We'll take little breaks throughout for that. Um, so first of all, why compost? And before I go into my spiel about that, let's see if I can do this. I'm gonna ask you all. Um, and now I apologize that I think you can, I can't, I think you can only pick one answer. So if you could just click on, what's the primary reason you compost? Um, for me, I would say it's all of them. <laughs> yeah, one person already clicked that. Um, but it could be different depending on um, 
you know, some people aren't really that into compost, but they want to keep their food scraps out of the trash. And that's cheap way to do it compared to like paying a fee every time you drop them off. Um, some people are gardeners and that's really important to them. Um, I'm seeing uh, almost half is all of the above. It's cheaper. You might have a garden. You don't want to put your food scraps in the trash. Plus it's not allowed in Vermont. Um, I think Okay, I'll just say a few more seconds. I don't know if you all can see it, but um, yeah, I'll close it out in about 10 seconds. We've got almost everybody participating. Um, yeah, I almost wish I could make this open-ended. If you don't see your reason for composting here, the chat box is a good place to put that. And like Amanda was saying earlier, put your question in the Q&A, but if you just have a comment, that the chat box is a good place for that. Okay, so we have almost everybody participate I'm going to um, end it now so we can move on. Um, I hate to end it because people are still answering the poll, um, but okay, I'm ending it now. So now you should be able to see. So most people, about half, are composting for all of the reasons listed here for the garden, keeping this food scraps out of the trash. It's cheaper than dropping it off and paying a fee, although there are some drop off options where there isn't a fee. Um, maybe you always want to try, and here's a good way to get started. Um, and some people just think it's really cool. I'm one of those people. I think it's really amazing to see how um, you can turn something that, you know, people think of as trash, like food scraps, into this valuable product. Um, okay, I'm going to close out the pool, the poll, sorry. So another reason to compost is about a fifth of all of the material that goes to the landfill in Vermont is, tr is food scraps or organic. So that could be leaf and yard waste or food scraps. Um, that's a huge amount. Um, it, when it's in the landfill, it, it generates methane, which is about 30 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. Um, and that number depends on how the calculation is made. Um, but that one ultimately comes from the EPA. We got it from Science Daily, but they got it from the EPA. Um, and the other thing that if you've already composted, you might notice that once you're managing your food scraps in a compost system in your backyard, your trash isn't stinky anymore. I mean, we all have that stereotype of gross, trash is gross and stinky. It really isn't that gross or stinky if you aren't putting food in it. Um, so that's another good reason to just, it's actually cleaner and it's a, it's a cleaner way to handle your materials. Um, okay, so sorry, I got off a little bit. Um, I'm going to switch gears here now and Theron's going to, oh my gosh, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Please forgive, please know that we're just people who are still working our way through using Zoom, so we might have some weird glitches. I'm going to stop talking and let Theron talk about uh, the universal recycling law. All right. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> so the universal recycling law in Vermont, Act 148, is all about, as Cassandra mentioned, food scraps, recycling, and a couple of other items, including leaf and yard waste, uh, clean wood, all these things that we as a state have decided have higher and better uses and are um, able to be recycled. And, uh, and we can also keep some, keep some of that out of the landfill. Uh, some of you may know that we only have the one landfill in Vermont and it um, is a limited space situation. So, um, so, Back to food scraps for businesses, um, they've been required to divert food scraps since 2014 based on, on how much they produce. So large producers of food scraps, say grocery stores and restaurants have been keeping those out of the trash um, for longer. And then starting in July this past summer, um, everybody has been uh, asked to divert those from the trash. And to do that, there are a lot of different ways. So we have, as we mentioned, backyard composting. And um, that's something that pretty much anyone can do if they have the space to. You can also <clears throat> bring it to a drop-off site. Every transfer station in Vermont has a food scrap collection um, bucket or, uh, or tote like you see here. There's also a, a, a huge network of commercial composters. So people that, um, that operate larger compost facilities and they pick up the food scraps from those larger generators like the grocery stores. 
You also have some people who don't have a, a compost system themselves, but their neighbors do. So that's sometimes a nice, uh, nice way to, to manage it. And uh, anybody who composts pretty much, um, they would, I'm sure they would be happy to accept some food scraps from, from their neighbors, um, especially if they garden. So they can keep uh, producing good compost for their, for their, um, for their garden. Uh, the other thing that, that some people do is community composting. There are larger compost systems at uh, some community organizations or, uh, or apartment buildings, for example. And those are larger systems that can, that can handle that kind of volume. And there's, there are really cool programs that people run to make sure that those are working well and maintained and processing that material properly. In Vermont, there are also a number of curbside pickup options. People will um, sometimes offer a five gallon bucket or if it's, a, if it's an apartment building, you might get a 48 gallon tote and you can get it picked up weekly. Uh, there is a charge for that. So it's a trade off, do it yourself or pay for the service. But um, you know, whatever works for you is, is just fine. You can also drive it to a, to a drop off site uh, like this image here on the right is of Vermont Compost Company, their drop-off site, which is just outside of Montpelier. And they are one of those commercial composters. And so, so they'll accept food scraps uh, from residents, from people who uh, you can just drive up and, um, and empty your food scraps in there and, uh, and they will process those for you. Uh, now this universal recycling law is for food scraps, but it does leave out meat and bones. Those, since they, do tend to attract animals um, are still okay to put in the trash. And uh, we'll talk about some other options for dealing with those a little bit later in the webinar, but under, the, under this law, you don't need to compost those at home because of that potential issue with animals. So the next thing we're gonna go into is what compost is exactly. And, uh, and let's start by by saying compost is the end result of the process of composting. So what we're doing when we're composting is we are encouraging the breakdown of the food scraps that we're generating. And to do that, we've got to mix them up with some other materials. So um, like I said, that end result that you see this person holding in their hands, that is finished compost. That's uh, that great fertilizer that you can put on your <clears throat> lawn or garden. And it's a combination of materials that you put in. The, the food scraps that you put in are gonna provide nitrogen. We call those greens. And then it also needs something to balance it out and soak up some of the moisture. So we use a carbon source, which we call browns. And we'll talk about all of the different things you can use for that um, in the recipes section. Uh, the important thing to remember <clears throat> for compost is that um, it is, if you're buying it, it's, an, it's a value added product. So it takes, it takes work to collect it, say from somebody's uh, curbside, like from their house, collect those food scraps. You've got to mix them up with those other inputs and process them and monitor it and, you know, meet all the, uh, the standards that, that the different organizations put down for, um, for quality. And then, then you can sell it and, and it is a, a value added product. So that's what you're paying for when you're buying compost. So the other, well, probably the most important thing about compost is that you have to remember that it's alive. The, that breakdown of the materials that you're going for is achieved because of the bacteria and the microbes and the, the bugs and the worms and the, the fungi that um, they're all working to eat and break down and chew up those food scraps that you put in there. Um, the organisms that do that, they are organisms that use oxygen, and that means it's an aerobic process as opposed to an anaerobic process, which would happen, say, in a landfill um, with no air because it's all squished down and covered up. So this is a, an image of, of some of those microorganisms that you would, uh, would see in your compost if you looked at it under a microscope. And... Um, and there's some pretty cool shapes in there. Um, <laughs> there's bacteria, fungi, and there's a lot of them. So uh, as you can see here, a teaspoon of soil has between a mil 100 million and a billion microorganisms, which kind of defies imagination. Um, so if you think of a whole compost pile, 
that's a really active and um, and living sort of um, conglomeration of, of bugs and bacteria and stuff. But that's what you want. So <clears throat> when you're composting and when you're backyard composting, especially, your job is to make sure that those that those um, those microorganisms are happy and thriving. And if you, the best way to do it is to think of it as a pet. Um, they need food, so that's your food scraps. It needs air. Um, if it gets too compacted, um, it'll go anaerobic. Uh, like I said, uh, you know those organisms like oxygen to to live. Um, so stirring it up, we'll talk about that. And uh, you need to have the right amount of water. Um, so food, air, and water, just like your pets. And uh, if you provide your compost system and your, um, and your bin with that, you're gonna put out some great compost that will be really beneficial to any sort of living plant that you put it on or um, you know, fertilize with it. So, I, I think um, I just talked about the, uh, the carbon. Those are the browns and the nitrogen, the greens. Um, and we're going to come back to this recipe, but generally speaking, you want a lot of carbon and a little bit of nitrogen. So you want two to three times the volume of carbon to uh, one time the volume of nitrogen. A three to one ratio of, say, wood shavings, browns, to food scraps, greens. All right, Cassandra is gonna tell us all about the different systems that we can use. All right, and um, I wanted to just jump in and apologize for the crazy back and forth on the slideshow. That's me, I'm driving the slideshow today and uh, there's a little bit of a weird issue when I'm dealing with the control panel here and the slideshow, so forgive me, um, that might happen again. Um, it isn't something we've worked out how to deal with yet, but. Um, I also just wanted to invite Amanda to jump on and maybe we could answer a couple of the questions that are coming through. Yep. So we've got a pile of questions. So the first question is kind of an open pile question and it's, can I just dump my kitchen waste in the backyard without any special container? Well, we'll be talking about that in this next section. And then there's a question about composting citrus fruits and whether or not they can do that. We're going to cover um, that in the in the recipe section. We'll talk about all the different things you can put in and, and the things that you shouldn't. Yeah. And just, um, I'm just going to jump in and say any questions about uh, what goes in or out. Um, yeah, yeah. We'll just quickly say now, if it's ever been food, it can be composted. And Theron's going to go into a lot more detail about that later in the webinar. Yeah. One question about that is a little bit different is um, Vermont compost does not take dryer lint or hair. I was just wondering if there, I, there's a reason why I can't put mine, mine in my compost. Yeah, uh, for dryer lint, I don't see any reason you can't put your hair in. I'm not sure what that is, except it's possible it doesn't break down. But dryer lint um, is basically a little pile of microplastics. Um, unless you have 100% natural fiber clothing, which it would be great, but is unlikely. Um, all anything you have that's uh, micro fleece or any other, most materials have some kind of nylon spandex. And so lint is now another source of microplastics. And I would highly recommend that you keep it out of your compost pile. All right. Um, when you talk about a three to one ratio, is that weight or volume? How do you measure that? Well, that's volume. <clears throat> and uh, usually, we measure that with scoops. So, um, you know, and you can eyeball it too, but you put in, um, you know, a bucket, say a five quart pail of food scraps, you should put in two to three of those of, uh, of a wood shavings or some other carbon source. Yeah. Does right, backyard compost um, increase methane Amanda, as it does with that landfill? We're gonna I, hold that question mm -hmm. and move on to the next section. And okay. we'll take a break after this section too. Um, and then we'll take two or three questions then. So if you didn't get your question answered now, we'll, we'll be coming back to them later and we'll be again, saving some of them till the end. Um, but I think we need to move on in the webinar and then we'll, we'll do some, a few more questions in a little bit. Okay, so, um, so the reason why we started with what is compost and Theron talked about that recipe, three times as many browns to greens, 
because that's kind of an important concept to have in place before you decide how are you going to compost um, on your property and um, or in your backyard. Um, so part of it is just keeping in mind that that ratio three to one means if you're going to be putting some food scraps in every day or every other day or a couple times a week, you're going to need to have those browns on your property. So in this section, after I go through all the compost systems, I'm also going to talk about, you know, you how are you going to keep all those browns around? You should have start thinking about, you know, where you're going to store them. You're going to need a bag of dried leaves or a, a bale of wood shavings or something. So, okay, whether you've been composting already and you have logged on here as a refresher or for some ideas to change your system, or whether this is new for you, I want you to just stop and think about your situation. That's the first step for figuring out how you want to set up your compost. So be realistic about your space. How much lawn do you have? Um, your goals, like for we, at the beginning, a lot of people mentioned that they compost because they garden. Um, so your goal might be to, to create a lot of compost. So you have a, you can put it on your gardens. It might be just to keep your food scraps out of the trash. And if that's a goal, um, you know, some of these systems might be good for that. Some of them might not. Um, also your time and energy is really important. Some of the systems we're going to talk about will require more of your time and energy and some will require less. So really be realistic about who you are. It's not gonna work if you set yourself up to compost in a bin or in a system that's gonna require you to do a lot that you realistically don't have time for. And if you go through all this and you realize you don't have the right space in your yard, that's another consideration um, that would make maybe make you wanna consider another option for your food scraps. So with that said, I'm gonna go through some of the common ways that people compost. And there are dozens of other ways people compost. Sometimes I think there's a different way of composting for each individual. <laughs> Everybody does things a little bit differently, but there's a, kind of a three or four of like the standard types of, of setups you've probably seen or heard about. And the first one we're gonna start with is called a soil saver. Um, and that's a brand name, but basically we're talking about a store-bought pre-made bin. It could be any brand name. Um, and just one thing I wanna say, because we're grant funded, we actually were able to buy some soil savers that are we're giving away to people who are participating in this webinar. So the way to get it is you have to be from one of our 19 member towns. And when we send you the follow-up email after this webinar, you if you take our three question survey about how you like the webinar, then you can schedule a time to pick up your free soil saver. Um, we'll tell you more about that later. But right now I wanna talk about um, how you, the pros and cons of using a pre-made bin. So, I mean, to me, one of the pros is, you know, it's pretty simple. They're usually easy to set up um, within 20 minutes, half an hour if you're slow, you'll have a bin and you can start using it right away. Um, if you live in a neighborhood or, you know, where your neighbors might be picky about what, you know, where there's some expectations or standards around your yards, um, this is an enclosed, tidy, neat looking thing. So that's another benefit in terms of just being a neighborly or, you know, keeping your property looking nice. Um, one of the pros and cons, it's not on this list, but is that um, a pro is that if you look at this image, you can see they have this completely unrealistic thing where like the perfectly black compost is spilling loosely out of this little drawer door thing. Um, that will never happen. Your compost is never gonna look perfect like that because it'll, you know, unless you screen it, but it usually has little bits of broken eggshell or like avocado peel or things that don't break down all the way. Um, and also it's by the time it's, you know, finished and at the bottom of the bin, it's going to be compact. So when you open that door, you're not going to have this, you know, display like thing, but that said, you can't tell from this image, but this is just sitting on the ground. There's no bottom. And the reason is because those microorganisms that, that are naturally in the soil, um, that's actually ideal for composting to just have it sit directly on the ground. You don't need special soil or to add anything. Microorganisms that you need for the compost to happen are already in the soil, even if it's a poor quality soil. Um, so that's good that the, your materials will be touching the ground. 
directly. The part that makes that challenging is that it, um, it's easy for animals to get in there. And we will talk at the end about some specific strategies to keep animals out. But I would say if you're considering a pre-made bin, you, would, you should consider also using hardware cloth. And hardware cloth is that stiff, like wide mesh screen that it's not a cloth, it's a metal. Um, but it's usually you can get it in quarter inch, half inch, or even inch um, mesh screen. And it, uh, if you get quarter or half inch, it'll keep rodents out and animals out. So what I do, I have a, not this exact model, but I have a pre-made bin and I just lay hardware cloth on the ground about four to six inches bigger around than the actual bottom of the bin. Um, and what that does is it stops animals from being able to dig down under and come up inside the bin. So that's a pro and a con. You get the advantage of the microorganisms, but you have to do one extra thing to keep animals out. Um, the other thing I would say is that depending on the size of your household, this is a good system. But um, if you look at the, uh, the wall of that, that is a um, black plastic. And you can tell that it's hard to see, but you can see where my, arrow, my cursor is. There's little vent holes in there and you can see them better on this doorway. So it's sort of like the manufacturer knows you're supposed to have aeration. Remember food, air, water. Um, however, basically you're looking at a wall of plastic, meaning it's not really getting the natural aeration that it needs. Um, so you are going to have to get in there with a pitchfork or some kind of a turning tool or even a stick and just aerate it yourself uh, every two to three weeks or even every month or two. Um, but so that's something you should know about this kind of a bin. You're going to have to do your aerating yourself. And finally, I would say, ideally, you would have two of these. If you start with one, um, that should get you started. But ideally, you have one that's always working and one that has materials that are resting and um, just, you know, they've gone through the composting process and they're resting, say, over the winter. And then you always have one bin that you're filling and one bin that's, um, that has finished material in it. Um, so that's soil savers. I'm sure there's some questions and we're going to stop after this whole section to answer them. Okay, open pile. Somebody had asked, uh, you know, can I just throw my food scraps on the ground? Well, okay, there's two answers to that. Yes, you can, but I do not recommend it. Um, and I actually, for around 20 years um, in my earlier part of my adult life, that I pretty much composted in an open pile. Um, there's, it is composting. Some people call it lazy composting. Some people don't call it composting, but if you are layering greens and browns and they're in a pile, yes, it's composting. Um, and there's some, there's some nice things about that. Like it's really easy to turn the pile and it gets natural aeration. The air will come naturally into the sides and it kind of comes up like a chimney up through the top. Um, there's a lot of nice things about that, but the downside is uh, more and more people in the state are composting. And if you have an open pile, you're going to have animals in that pile and you're going to in, attract animals that will, could be pests for you or your neighbors. Um, and it also could harm um, people's pets. And um, I have a note here I'm on Mabel the dog at this bullet temp point down here. Mabel uh, was actually a golden retriever dog in Montpelier, which is where our offices are located. And uh, Mabel got into somebody's open compost pile and they ate some decomposing food that had a neurotoxin in it. And there, I don't know all the details, but there some foods as they decompose do have a neurotoxin that if consumed by a dog can make them sick at best, but they can also die from it. And this dog, Mabel, did die. Um, and so just in the interest of protecting people's animals and keeping pests out of your yard, we encourage you to enclose your compost pile. Um, so, so my answer, my final answer to the person who wants to know, can they just throw food scraps in their yard? I would say, please don't. Um, it's not good for, it's also going to create a mess in your yard. So we're telling you it, so you know it's legit if you've done it, but we're going to ask you to consider ways that you can enclose that pile. So that's like the simplest system. Now we're going over to the, you know, other end of the spectrum, a two or three bin system. This is, um, a system that's going to require a little bit more work. So when you are thinking about your time and your energy and your space, if you uh, are into this, 
and you know you have big gardens and you want to be doing a lot of composting, I do think a two bin system, if you're a single family household or a three bin, if you're multiple households, is a really good way to go. It's got the advantage of having the two bins that I talked about with the soil saver earlier, where you should really consider having two ultimately. Um, so you have them all together and it's really easy to turn material from one bin to the other. Um, I would say this is, it's not the only way to compost. I have here that it's the most effective. I'm not sure if that's true because as long as you're managing your pile, it's going to be effective regardless of what system you have. Um, the key thing is that you have, when you build this, you are lining it with hardware cloth. Ideally quarter inch hardware cloth, but you could definitely use half an inch and it would still be okay. Um, so I'm gonna look a little closer and kind of talk you through how this would work. Um, so first of all, um, take a look over here on the left where my, where my arrow is. This is some kind of a like sheep fence cylinder with just leaves in it. And it, we're, we surmise, Theron and I have been over this webinar a lot and it looks to us like these are oak leaves that probably fell from this tree right here and they just raked them up and they're using them as browns in the pile, which is great. So um, you didn't have to do anything special. They're not, nobody shredded them. You can do all that, but these are basically just leaves someone raked up and they're storing them in that open cylinder. Now, you might wanna cover your stored browns, but the first thing I wanna point out is that this whole system, part of the system is storage for the carbons. And that's the first thing to think about. Now we've got this nice well-built three bin system. And I don't know if you can tell by this photo, but in between each bin, it's lined with hardware cloth and the whole back is hardware cloth. So that's doing two things. It's protecting it from animals. It's keeping animals out. And it's also allowing for natural aeration. Um, so it's really beneficial to use that hardware cloth if you're gonna build your own bin. And then the way this kind of front part works is these are uh, boards that will slide up. So if you want to you know, move material from one bin to another, you just slide out these boards until you get to a point where you can start using your pitchfork um, and you move the material in between bins. So you start by adding your material to one bin. I usually start on the left. You could start in the middle, you could start on the right, whatever. But let's say you start over here on the left, you add your food scraps, add your browns, add your food scraps, add your browns until it's as full as you want it. That might be half full, that might be three quarters full. It's very rarely gonna fill all the way up because as you add, material, the older materials are constantly breaking down. So you'll see the pile go up and down. And then at some point it's full, you move everything uh, with, I typically use a pitchfork for this into the next bin over. And you can see here, this is called the resting bin. So after you've, you've turned everything over here, so you've aerated it by turning it. And notice you didn't have to do a lot of that. There's no really like moving things around with your pitchfork until you move it, you just move it and it's aerated and then cover it with your browns and that's resting and it sits. And then you start all over and you add to the pile and add to the pile and add your browns, which are right nearby and you're adding food scraps and browns and then it's full and it's time to move it. So then you move everything in here to the finished pile and, um, and move everything in here to the middle. So it's sort of like constantly rotating. This is my favorite system for composting. It's this size, this three bin size, is kind of big for a regular household. I don't think you need that if you're a single family. If you live in an apartment complex and there's like four, five, six, ten 10 units, this would be perfect for that. Um, but for one or two households, it might be a bit much. So you could do the same thing with a two bin. It's the same thing, but it's two bins. And there's Theron and this is Jan. Theron and, Theron and Jan built this. Um, and they, Theron designed it, it's based off of our basic three bin system, but he just tweaked the design. Um, and this was the prototype that he's actually tweaked this design since then. Um, and we will, in your follow-up email, you'll have a link to where to find the plans for this on our website, they're free. Um, and so this was, you know, this was something, we actually filmed it when they built the prototype. I'm not sure if the film is helpful, but you can see them do it. It's very short. We sped it up like, you know, a hundred times or something. So it looks like a Charlie Chaplin film. Um, so the nice thing about the two bin system is you can do everything that you can in the three bin, but it's sized more appropriately for a single household or even a couple families. Um, and you can see just like with the three bin, 
um, the front is is all boards that slide in and out, but the sides in the back are hardware cloth and the bottom is hardware cloth. So you can still get that benefit of materials being next to the soil. You still get the aeration and you get protection so animals can't get in there, or at least it gives it a hard, it gives them a harder time. Um, okay, so moving on, that was um, like your basic compost bins. Those are a couple styles. Um, I'm sure there are people who, let's ask, I'm gonna ask you guys to participate for a second. I think there's a feature where you can raise your hand. Raise your hand, virtually raise your hand, if you currently use a tumbler or you're thinking about using a tumbler. Okay, so we've got, it's like piling on. It's already 25 out of 112, 26, 27. Um, so significant number of you, a lot of you are using tumblers or, or considering it. Now, okay, well, let's stop that and we're gonna do one more hand raising thing. Um, so if your tumbler works, if it's working well for you, raise your hand. I'm seeing fewer hands up, 12, 13. So, okay, that's good to know. And <laughs> I asked that for a reason because typically tumblers are harder to use than a regular compost bin, even though it all seems a lot simpler, doesn't it? It's like, it's fully enclosed. You can turn it, which aerates it. Yeah, so of the people who said that they're composting the tumbler about, I would say maybe a third um, are saying it's working for them, maybe a little more than a third. Um, so we're gonna talk about some ways to make your tumbler work and some ideas for um, integrating it into a different kind of a system. So you can still use your tumbler, it'll still work, but it might be part of a larger compost system. So first of all, pros and cons. Um, this is an example, you could make a tumbler. There's an example of one of the many plans for a DIY, um, or you can buy them pre-made. The nice thing about them, if you are concerned about animals, is they're fully enclosed. So, um, the, but then again, remember if it's fully enclosed, it's not touching the soil. So it's not automatically getting that nice little like inoculation with the microorganisms. So keeping that in mind, you might need to every now and then add a shovel full of soil into your tumbler to kind of keep those microorganisms working and refreshed. Um, it is a little hard to work properly because some of the issues that come up with tumblers are not the microorganisms aren't there. It might have gone anaerobic because um, people forget that they have to add browns to the tumbler the same way you do to a bin. So with a tumbler, you also need your little storage for wood shavings or leaves or whatever you're using for browns. Um, and sometimes they actually get really wet too. And you can see like, you know, this one is fully enclosed. This one has holes. So just like with a regular bin, you need to monitor food, air, and water. And you're gonna have the added um, piece of adding some soil every now and then. Um, and then there's also the fact that it's pretty small. It's usually smaller than a regular bin. So it may fill up. And then what do you do when it's full? Um, <laughs> that's an issue that comes up sometimes. People have been using their tumbler and then it's full and because it hasn't had enough time for everything to break down. So, you know, without having something planned, you might have like be able to not be able to drop off your food scraps in your backyard. So here's a couple fixes for that. One is if you are gonna use a tumbler, this one is expensive. This is, you know, if you're gonna use a, a Yora or a Jora tumbler, this is probably the top of the line Rolls Royce of the tumblers. Uh, apologies for the blurry photo. Um, but they do run like the small, this is the smallest basically designed for a single household. They do run somewhere between two and $300 if you can get it in bulk. Um, and the bigger they are, the more expensive they are, but they are very easy to turn. They have two chambers and you can see here, this one chamber is open. So you can see it's a totally enclosed chamber and one is closed. So when you fill up one chamber, you close it, there's a latch on it. You close it, latch it, and then you fill up the other chamber. And in the time that you've, you know, we've got one chamber that's full and resting while you're filling the other chamber. Typically, I wouldn't say it's all, it, it's, you can fully compost food scraps in these, but even if you don't, what my method is, I have a Jora and I have a couple of um, pre-made bins. And what I'll do is when I've filled up my Jora, when you get both sides full, then you empty the resting side 
and I will put it into my pre-made bin along with my other food scraps and it finishes composting in a bin. And what that does is it um, does the first part of the decomposition of the food scraps in an enclosed system. So it keeps animals out, um, but it also allows it to finish decomposing in a bin. Um, you still add the same browns. It's a little smaller in a tumbler. It's like more of a one-to-one -one ratio than a three-to-one. Um, and it allows me to like, the aeration is a lot easier in a tumbler too. Um, so that's my recommendation if you have a tumbler is pair it with a bin. If you can't pair it with a bin, then I recommend that you really get good at managing it and make sure you have your brown storage right nearby. And you still might need like um, some kind of a place to put the materials after they've been through your tumbler for a while. Um, whether that's in directly into a garden or into a bin or something, or maybe you have two tumblers you're using. You, Fill one up till it's full, let it rest, keep tumbling it now and then, and then fill another one up. Um, and it takes, but that takes a while. That might take six months or a year. Um, okay, so I see a bunch of questions coming in. I'm, so those are the three basic compost systems, a pre-made bin, a make your own bin, two or three bin system, and a, um, and a tumbler. There's a lot of others. There's, you know, you know, people do pit composting where they dig a big hole and compost in the hole. People make pallet bins. I didn't purposely don't put those on this uh, webinar because their animals can get into them really easily um, unless you line them with hardware cloth. But for the, the purposes of what we're doing today, those are the three basic systems you'll see regularly. And then there's this thing called a green cone. Um, I saved the green cone for last because this is not truly composting. So Everything we've said about composting applies to composting, but not necessarily to green cones. And the reason is because these are actually uh, closer to a digester. Um, they're actually also called solar cones. Um, and what you see here, this green cone, it's actually a, a green outer cone with a black inner cone. And there's about a half inch of airspace between them. And then underground, these were just installed in this photo. Underground is about a three foot by three foot uh, basket. It looks kind of like a very sturdy laundry basket. So when you open this lid, your food scraps go into this underground basket and they decompose uh, more like in a digestive, like a digester underground. So in a green cone, there's a few things that have to be in place. And this is why I said, think about your, your space and your yard. Um, in, in a green cone, you have to have full sun or it won't work. Now it can be just a half a day of full sun, but you have to have that. If you only have shade, a green cone won't work. Um, ideally, it goes into well-drained soil, um, but there are fixes for that. You can create drainage by digging a, digging a bigger hole than you need, putting some gravel around it, et cetera. These are terrific if you're somebody that wants to manage your food scraps, but you're not really a gardener because you're never gonna get compost out of it. This, once you install the green cone, it stays there. You don't dig it up. You don't get anything out of it. It's just decomposing food scraps. I will say that when the materials are in that basket decomposing, they are leaching nutrients into the soil all around them. So you can see the, it's hard to tell because these were just installed, but this is actually installed in an area where there are ornamental planting. So some people will install their green cone in the middle of a vegetable garden, and then they'll plant vegetables around them um, to, to take advantage of all those nutrients that are leaching into the soil. Um, the other thing that is really great about green cones is that because they're fully enclosed and they're digesting that composting, you can put in meat scraps, bones, fish, dairy. Some people use them for pet waste. Um, and by pet waste, I mean the poop and the pee, not the actual cat litter. Like don't put cat litter in your green cone. That's a brown. If you add browns to a green cone, they'll stop working. So this isn't compost. It, all your compost system, you need three times as many browns and greens. In a green cone, in a digestive system, no browns. You just add the food scraps and close it up. Um, now, we have a lot more information about green cones on our website. Um, we sell them at cost. This is another item that we are giving away. We have 10 of these to give away to people who are at the webinar. So I, if it's something you're interested in, um, you know, and you live in our 19 member towns, you might be able to get one of these um, and try it out. And, and some, the other thing is I recommend if you um, 
if you eat a lot of meat um, or you want to use it just for pet waste, it could be something you have with a regular compost system. And the green cone is just for those things you don't want in your, in your compost bin, like meat and bones. Um, and then you compost the rest. That's another way people use them. Okay, we usually get like 15 minutes of questions just on green cones. So after this slide, we're gonna take a break for questions. Um, this is just kind of hammering home the point. Uh, Theron mentioned really early in this webinar, you need three times as many browns as greens. And then he mentioned it again with the image of the three buckets of browns to one bucket of greens. It, it's really important. If you wanna keep the smells down and you wanna keep animals away, one of your most important tools that you have is adding enough carbon. So that means you, you've got to have some way that you store it. Um, in this system, this is a pre-made bin and the, the, um, this is just a 32 gallon Rubbermaid trash can and that's filled with wood shavings. And I know that because this is part of my system and I have this trash barrel I use and I usually use wood shavings, but sometimes I get goat bedding. I have a friend who um, raises goats and the bedding is really dry and it has the added benefit of the little goat pellets in it. Sometimes I use leaves if it's the fall and I get leaves. Um, and this is a similar system. I'm just kind of hammering it home now. Um, this is actually at the synagogue in Montpelier. They have a soil saver and this is a smaller galvanized uh, can and they have wood shavings in there. So make sure you have something like that available near your own compost pile. Okay, I've talked for a long time. I'm gonna ask Theron and Amanda to pop on. Let's take a few questions. We won't be able to take them all, um, but we will, whatever we don't get to now, we will at the end. Hi everyone. <laughs> Whew, I feel like I need to rest my voice for a little while now. So what do we have for questions, Amanda? All right, so we have a lot of questions about browns, what, what things are browns and where to get browns. So we that's have questions section, about, so. yeah. yeah. But we'll save all those questions because that's all that Theron's gonna talk about in about one minute. Yeah, so we got that. And then we've got a couple more questions about what can go in your compost and what can't go in your compost. Okay, we'll save those because that's, that's also coming up in a minute. All right, and then um, someone wanted to know where they could get a green cone, which we covered. Yeah, and I'll just finish that up. So if you live in our district, and I realize we have participants that are outside the district, but if you are in our district, make sure you see our follow-up email, or you can actually, at the end of the webinar, if you stay around another minute, our, our survey should pop up. We're trying that for the first time with this webinar. Once you fill out that survey, you'll give us your email address and we'll get in touch with you. And you can choose either a green cone or a soil saver as a, a prize for joining the webinar during the sustainability series. If you don't live in our district, um, we can't, we're not selling outside our district, but you can get them online. Um, there are retailers online, even Amazon, I think has them. And if you live in Vermont, most of the solid waste management districts do sell green cones at uh, below retail prices. All right, we have one question about um, I failed to add brown to my vegetables um, for a while. It's kind of a, can you save your compost if you haven't added browns yet? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, just add the browns now. And um, I would say, you know, if they, you mean they've been composting and haven't yet added browns? Yeah, she, say, she says, you know, I've been adding, I haven't been adding any browns to my veggies. What do I do with my ve like ruined veggies? Oh, oh, it's easy. It should be easy. You add the browns now or it's freezing out right now. So you might have to just put the browns on top for now. And when things thaw out, I would get in there with a pitchfork and mix them up really good and get some aeration. It's likely without the browns uh, that it might have all kind of compacted and gotten a little anaerobic. It might smell bad during those few minutes when you're stirring it. And when you're done with that, I would add like two or three inches of browns on top. And then after that, every time you add food scraps, add the browns with, the, with them every time. And then how much sun does your compost bin have to be in? Um, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you put it in the sun, it'll get a little hotter, but it's they're perfectly fine in the shade. Green cones have to be in full sun, but it's less important for a compost bin. 
All right, and then the only other main question that's not really about what goes in and what goes out is um, winter composting, which I've been pointing people to. We have a whole webinar on winter composting, but if anyone wants to talk to that just a little bit. Um, yeah, I would just say that uh, you can compost through the winter. It just isn't, you're not going to see biological activity now, but you're getting all your materials layered in there. Um, if, it, if we get a thaw, you might be able to do a little bit of mixing. Um, and then it will all completely compost in the spring. Um, but we do have a webinar and um, it's recorded on our YouTube channel. So, um, you know, we will, you'll have an access to that when you get our follow-up email. And then a few questions about vermicomposting. Well, uh, let's cover the, uh, this next section and we'll have a more in-depth question and answer session at the end. Um, sounds like a lot of people have questions about what goes in and what doesn't. So let's talk about that. So um, this is, again, that three to one recipe, the greens and the browns. And I'm going to just go through a couple of examples. But um, so you want to have, as we said, three to one carbon to nitrogen, brown to green. And here we go. Um, we've got some examples there. Um, wood shavings, dried leaves, some dried hay, um, anything really that is is sort of high in carbon like that. I'm sorry, I have to interrupt you, Sarah. This happened again. I'm going to keep my video on because every time, oh God, please close your eyes. This is going to make you dizzy. Every time I go through the 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 dashboard to like turn off my video or turn off my mic i get out of sync on the webinar and it there isn't i apologize this is really amateur level stuff um All right. but here we go i'm keeping the video on. yeah so uh yeah like i was saying wood shavings dried leaves straw hay shredded paper those are all good sources of carbon um and um cassandra said uh, she also uses animal bedding um, that's because that's wood shavings as well. And um, a couple of places you can get that. You can get wood shavings in bales for specifically as animal bedding. It comes in, um, comes in these bales that are five or six bucks. You can get them at a yard and garden store or anywhere that um, like a, that, that sells or uh, animal products or, or supplies for taking care of pets. Um, and, and that's a good way to get them. You could also ask around at a local sawmill or a woodworking shop. They often have big bags of wood shavings that they're trying to get rid of and you can often get them for free. So um, if you're gonna be doing this a lot, I would recommend looking into that. Um, or if you're thinking about a community composting site, that might be a good way to, to supply your, your browns for that. Moving on to the greens. so. These are going to be high in nitrogen. These are your food scraps, your grass clippings, garden trimmings, and uh, green manures, so fresh manures that, um, uh, that do, uh, when they're fresh, have the potential to have pathogens and things in them, but um, you let them compost for a whole year mixed up, and those things are no longer an issue. Um, here it says garden trimmings, but not weeds, and the reason for that is that oftentimes if you're composting at home, it will not get hot enough to kill off the, the seeds from weeds. And so you'll often see that, that some of those will germinate and grow from the compost. Uh, this, this actually happens a lot with uh, like squash seeds. <laughs> um, and, uh, and if you've, you've composted for a while, you might, you might already be familiar with that. Um, so if you're gonna be composting weeds, you, you really wanna do it separately. And, um, and if it's, you know, if it's just weeds and uh, leaves and things like that, you could do it in an open pile. The, um, you wouldn't want to do food scraps in an open pile though. Um, now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about um, why carbon and why nitrogen. So carbon, uh, it, that supplies the energy for the bacteria and the microorganisms. And the nitrogen uh, supplies the building blocks for the proteins. So those two, um, those two main ingredients they, they supply everything that those organisms need to thrive. Um, so yeah, and I've got another, we have another note here that 
um, that food scrap size should be small. That's about surface area. The more um, that these pieces are interacting with each other, the quicker it'll happen, the faster your materials will compost and the, you know, the, the less you'll have to pick through and sift. Um, you know, you, you, might, you might always have little pieces of eggshell and like particularly hard things like avocado peels. Um, but if you, you know, if you chop stuff up or, or grind it um, or just even go at it with a shovel, um, and break it up a little bit, that'll help the, the whole process and move it along a little bit more. So let's talk a little bit more about examples. For food scraps, um, Cassandra said this before, but basically anything that was food is food scraps. Anything that was not food is not food scraps. <laughs> Don't try to compost that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, well, there are there are some exceptions like you know maybe napkins um, if you're doing it at home but if you're bringing it to a drop-off site you just want to put stuff that was food so yeah you've got your vegetable and fruit scraps you've got tea coffee grounds um, anything that's left over on the plate after dinner eggshells um, yeah napkins and tissues and stuff like that what you want to pay attention there to there is you don't want to have any coated papers. Um, a lot of things have plastic or wax coating on them, which helps you know keep them from breaking down, which is good if it's a package. But if it's in your compost bin, that just means it's going to sit there and not break down, and you're going to have to pick it out later. So um, this next image shows a couple of ways that people collect their food scraps in their kitchen. You can use any old container. Um, like a bucket or a basket or even a yogurt cup. Um, some people put liners in. I don't. I, I think the best thing is just a, some kind of hard container like a bucket or a pail that you can wash out easily and just hit it with the, the, sprink, the sink sprayer or the hose. Um, and if you wash it out every time you empty it and if you empty it regularly, um, it stays pretty clean. So. Um, yeah. Now we're going to talk about browns. So um, browns, like I said, those are the high carbon ones. Those are things like leaves and sawdust, dead plants, shredded paper, paper towels, uncoated um, paper plates. That can be a brown. Um, if you're going to be doing cardboard or uh, paper plates, stuff like that, it's best to cut it up. Um, like I said, the surface area is a big thing and the more that you, you know the smaller the pieces the more interaction they'll have um, you can see in this image there's some shredded paper there's also what looks up looks like some shredded up egg carton that's also a cardboard material and cardboard and paper are, are made from trees so those are inherently high in carbon um, I, I did see somebody had a question but we'll come to that in a little bit um, do you want to move on to the next one we have a the next thing is, is the kinds of the things we want to keep out of our backyard compost. So anything that was not food, as I said, um, that includes your fruit stickers, those PLU stickers, twist ties, rubber bands, flowers from a florist. And that's because they're often treated with fungicides. And if we look back to what we're trying to do here is we're trying to promote that biological activity and the fungicide or a pesticide is going to inhibit it. And um, it's gonna kill those, those organisms that we want to be living there and, and working on those, those food scraps for us. Meat and bones, we mentioned that those are exempted, but um, the main reason for that is just because it, it has the potential to attract animals. Um, and Cassandra did talk about the green cone, which is a great way to, to handle meat and bones if you, uh, if you wanna compost those on site. Um, aside from that, you can always um, you can always bring those to a commercial composter on the scale that they're doing it. Um, it it gets so hot and processes so quickly that it's really not an issue for for animal control. Uh, so now we'll take a couple of questions about about the uh, greens and browns. I saw one popped up about wood ash, and I'd like to like to talk about that. Uh, let's let's limit it to three questions because we're at the last section before we'll just do a full Q and A section. Do you want to yeah, answer sure. the wood ash question? 
Yeah, so uh, I think I saw somebody asked if wood ash was a brown. The answer is no. And the longer answer is don't put it in your compost. So wood ash, um, that is actually a, a basic um, compound and it's got salts in it. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna, it's gonna create uh, a more basic environment, which is the opposite of what the bacteria like. They like it a little less acidic. And um, so if you put wood ash in your compost, it's gonna inhibit um, that, that biological activity as well. Um, and the, the salt is also not great for it. So um, there are ways to use wood ash um, for other, other things, but it does not count as a brown and it does not go in your compost. All right, along the browns, we had a lot of questions about using things like shredded newspaper and bleached paper and whether or not that would cause any issues if it was bleached or it had ink on it. Nope, um, most inks are actually soy-based um, in newspapers and, um, and yeah, office paper is fine. It can be recycled as well, um, but if you don't have another source of browns, it is uh, perfectly fine. The one thing is it, it tends to, um, get really soggy and, and soak up more, more water. So it, it, um, it doesn't work as well as something with more structure like wood shape, wood chips or wood shavings. But Actually, I'd like to pop in for a second there. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're totally right. I agree with everything Theron's saying. I would just not recommend using only paper or, or, or cartons. Those can be, um, those can be definitely part of the browns you use, but not, you, you should have other browns as well. Mm -hmm. All right, and then we still had a lot of questions about how to get um, browns all year round. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so let's see, we covered the, um, you know, the, the animal bedding bales that you can get. Um, you can get those at, at really a lot of different stores. I mean, Tractor Supply or a couple of local ones would be a hardware store or uh, like a guy's farm and yard kind of the store. Um, anywhere that, that sells chicks or, um, or feed for animals will generally carry that kind of a, a bale of wood shavings. Um, and I did mention a that, you know, some places, if, if you're able to find like a local mill shop or a, a woodworking shop, they'll often have wood shavings that you can use. Um, the other thing you can do is you can collect leaves. So um, dried leaves were on, on there as a, um, as a brown source. Um, you can also use uh, dried grass clippings. So if you, if you mow um, and then let them dry in the sun, and then you can collect them and use those as a brown. If they're, if they're green, they're gonna be a nitrogen source, but if you dry them out, then they'll be more high in carbon. So. Amanda, the other thing that um, if people are looking for how to have some stored like through the winter, um, besides like there are the, like all the sources Theron mentioned, um, and depending on the space you have in your house or apartment, um, you could like save leaves in the fall. And, you know, I actually will collect some from my neighbors. Um, and that's totally like a year call because some people are worried, you know, if you don't, if you're not sure if the person you're getting leaves from uses pesticides or if you know there's certain um, invasive species if you're concerned about potentially getting something like that you might not want to get leaves from neighbors but if you know the person and you're comfortable with it sometimes just collecting a, a bunch of bags of leaves from other people in your neighborhood in the fall and those will last you quite a while and that might be a way to at least get through the winter or you know get you through till the next fall and those bales um like I said, they're, they're six bucks and they're pretty big. I mean, I'm not sure the volume of them, but they're, uh, they're probably two feet long by a yeah. foot, uh, by a foot and a half or so. So no, they're, they're bigger than that. They'll last a few months. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely worth the $6. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions on, uh, what goes in and what stays out or should we move on? we can move on for now. Okay. Okay, great. Um, okay, and this is our last section and we're gonna end by talking about animals um, and particularly bears. You can see the bear picture right there. Um, but this is where we're just gonna reiterate a lot of the stuff that we've already talked about and go into a little more detail. 
And then we'll, um, everything that we have talked to you about so far, specifically around the hardware cloth and the green, the browns to greens ratio, those are all designed to um, keep your compost pile so it doesn't have a bad smell and so that it's working and so that animals aren't able to get in or aren't interested. Um, so, but then we'll have more tips at the end around animals. So when we talk about air, there's a lot of questions people have and I just want to start by acknowledging this is a compost basics um, class. We are talking about basic backyard composting. So we haven't at all gone into thermophilic composting or hot composting. If you were hot composting, there's specific time and temperature you would need to pay attention to um, related to when you would want to aerate your pile. We're not doing that here. That's a whole other thing. That's like the next level. I, we have taught that. We could trot that out later in the year, but right now we're just talking about most of us in our backyards are not hot composting. It's called cold composting. It, it will get hot. You might notice if you have, I actually do take the temperature of my pile. Um, every now and then it will get up to 140 Fahrenheit, which is you know getting into thermophilic composting but it never maintains that temperature for the length of time it would need to be truly thermophilic composting. So I'm assuming we're all, so even if it's not, even if it's hot, even if it's hundred degrees or 120 degrees, we're calling that cold composting because it's not um, going through all of the processes involved. So in cold composting, it's less important exactly when or how frequently you aerate. Um, First of all, let's just talk about mechanically aerating the pile. Um, this is a picture of somebody using a pitchfork. That's the tool I usually use, but I also do have a tool that's specifically designed for turning composting. Compost. It looks a little bit like a little auger, and I just turn it, and it kind of like, you know, goes to the bottom of the pile, and then it pulls up like a core of the pile, and I'm able to pull material all the way from the bottom to the top, and I kind of do that around in like 10 spots. So I've turned my pile in about 10 minutes, maybe, maybe 10 minutes. It might even be just five minutes, but I do that in my pile maybe every three weeks, maybe once a month. I don't have a time schedule because I'm not hot composting. Um, Theron aerates his pile with a stick. You can literally stab it with a pointy stick. Um, what you're trying to do is create air pockets. So just, you know, stabbing it with a stick works just as much as turning it with a pitchfork. Um, unfortunately, I don't think anything's changed, but the last time I looked, I've looked at every hardware store that I come across in the central Vermont area, and at none of them have I seen compost turning tools, not the farm and garden stores, not regular hardware stores, not the places that, you know, say that they're just only sell tools. So I've had to go online to find a specific tool for compost turning, but they're easy to find online and they're around $25. Um, I think you can get one on Amazon or you know, you could go to like garden supply and places like that. Um, so what happens when you're aerating? Well, remember way back in the beginning of the webinar when Theron was talking about the microorganisms without which you don't have compost. Um, they're living beings and creatures and they need oxygen to survive. Um, so that oxygen means it's an air, you need to aerate add oxygen to the pile. So what you're doing is you're basically creating oxygen pockets so your microorganisms can thrive. Um, and by doing so, you're speeding up the composting process. So just by stabbing it with a pitchfork or turning it, you're creating those new passageways um, and it just helps all of the processes around the microorganisms, um, you know, decomposing the food helps it happen faster. And by doing so, because the microorganisms are able to, you know, thrive and, you know, move around and like, you know, survive and optimally with it by oxygenating your pile, um, it actually will compost faster if you're turning the pile regularly. Um, it will, it, you know, it'll eventually compost if you don't, but one of the reasons we keep talking about aerobic and anaerobic, the reason you want those microorganisms to survive be, not just because they are the decomposers, but once your pile goes anaerobic, meaning it's not aerated, it might be wet, maybe it doesn't have browns, that's when it gets really stinky. If you have any association of composting being gross and stinky, 
it's because you encountered an anaerobic compost pile. Um, and all you have to do to fix that is add some browns and mix it up and then cover it with browns. Um, so, you know, it's up to you how frequently you want to aerate. My strategy is sometimes I just do it every few weeks. And then if it looks like it's starting to get anaerobic, and by that, I mean, if I'm starting to smell something that smells yucky, um, then I'll turn it. And that doesn't happen very often, but when it does, turning it fixes it. And for, for anybody who's watching, who's um, composting over the winter, like I am, one thing that I can guarantee you will happen is that in the spring, when you're ready to turn your pile, that first time you turn it after it sat all winter, it's gonna smell bad. And that's because it's been sitting all winter. There's no way you can turn it when it's frozen. And so that first time you're gonna turn it and add more browns, I don't know when that's gonna be, maybe if we're lucky in April. <laughs> um, yeah, don't worry about that. It'll smell while you're like, you know, exposing it and adding the air passageways and turning it. You put layer some browns on top and it'll stop smelling and the smell will waft away and then it will start working again and you'll kind of, you know, get those microorganisms going. So the next thing is water. We didn't, we have not talked about uh, water very much. We talk about, you know, regularly your microorganisms need food, air, and water. And the food is the greens and the browns, your food scraps and your carbons. And the air is when you're turning the pile, whether it's a tumbler and you're turning it or a two or three bin system and you're moving material from one to the other or uh, a bin where you're just doing what we just talked about, you're aerating it. Water is also important, but you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, a good test for how much you need and how much is too much. Um, one of the things I would say is that your food scraps are usually pretty wet. And if you are someone who has saved food scraps either to drop off at a drop off site or use in a bin, you've probably noticed after they sit for a few days, there is a little liquid at the bottom. That's because they're mostly water. So you're already adding water when you add your food scraps. The rest is basically eyeballing it. Just like with the volume, three times as many carbons to greens, you're basically gonna eyeball that. It's not gonna be an exact measurement. Same thing with the water. What you're aiming for, the ideal level of humidity or dampness for the microorganisms to thrive is, um, is the, that your compost bin is about as damp as the feeling of a wet sponge that has been squeezed out. You know that everybody's familiar with that feeling. And you can do this in your pit bin. You can use your hand with a glove, without a glove, um, just scoop up a bit of the compost and squeeze it. And if it's dry and crumbly, then water it. Literally like you see in this picture with a watering can or with a hose. Um, if it's if it's pretty sloppy and wet, like it probably will be in the spring when you start getting ready to turn it for the first time since the last, you know, before winter, um, it might be too wet. Then you might want to add browns or just leave it and let it drain. Um, if it is too wet or it's too dry, the microorganisms are, are going to die off. So it's important to keep it at just that right level of um, dampness. And that's, that is kind of by feel and sight and using your senses. Okay, now we're at the last slide before we go into our Q&A section. And this is the thing a lot of people come for is just about how to deal with animals. And the first thing I'm gonna focus on is bears because in Vermont, this is something that comes up every spring, at least for the last several years. I mean, it's there's been a, an increase in the bear population and an increase in human bear interactions, which uh, there's a, lo a long list of reasons why. It's not only because the bear population may be bigger, but it's also because humans have gotten dumber. Let's just put it, say it how it is. You know, <laughs> you know, people who are purposely leaving out food for bears, for example, or who are doing things that attract bears and not stopping them, or who think it's pretty and cute and take pictures of them. Any of that is behavior that um, actually could end up killing the bear. Um, also, some people aren't composting because they're afraid bears are going to go in their yard. So I'm going to talk about bears for a minute. First of all, um, in at least where we are in Vermont, if you take down your bird feeders between, I think it's between March and December, um, that is a that's a good way to keep the bears from coming in your yard. Now. If you live in a place where there's been a bear that's in the neighborhood, like 
probably predictably every year in the spring. Often they're they're you know out sniffing around. They sometimes they have roots that they go on regularly, and you might have a bear that comes through your area every year. So even if you take down your food bird feeders this year, they might still sniff around. So it's going to take a little more than that, but start by really adhering to those guidelines around bird feeders. And just to be, so you know, this is something that Theron and I learned from, um, from the Vermont's bear biologist. Bear can smell food from one or two miles away. That's miles, one or two miles away. And they know if you've got bird seed in your bird feeder. Um, it's a concentrated protein and they will come for it. What they won't come for is your compost. It doesn't mean that they might not check it out if they're in the area, but they're not coming out of the woods or from a mile or two away because you're composting. Um, but what is happening is they might be coming anyway. And then if they're in the area and there's compost, they're going to come sniff around and maybe like, you know, dive in there. So what else can you do? One thing is you keep your meat out of the bins. Um, also in the spring, like I'd say up until like the end of May even, keep sweet smelling fruit out of your bin. That's when the bears are really just active. And um, especially some of the yearlings that haven't yet learned how to forage for themselves. Um, so things like cantaloupe rinds, strawberry holes, uh, those things you might want to either bury in a trench composting or a pit or drop those off at a food scrap, like drop off site just until the bear have, you know, the fruit is, there's stuff they can forage in the forest. Um, so the other thing, I mean, we've talked about browns and hardware cloth, um, that will help keep them uninterested, but if they're already coming, the other thing is, uh, the ammonia trick. And what that is, is you just use ammonia and you soak a rag in it and you leave it out near your compost pile. I would put it in a bucket of some sort and every week or two, just soak it again. And if you think about it, what happens is. Um, they have those sensitive noses. I mean, they have very, very powerful scent of, of smell, sense of smell. So that really harsh chemical smell in ammonia freaks them out and they don't want to come near it. So I would say like what I would do is if you have a bear in your neighborhood, start by putting out a couple of those ammonia soaked rags where you don't want them to be. Um, the worst case scenario, this is something you can do um, it's a little bit more expensive, but if you really have a problem, you could put some um, electric fencing around your garden or compost area. And actually the um, Forest Hammond, the bear biologist even recommends that you bait it with peanut butter. So the bear might like one time try to touch the wire, get electrocuted, then not electrocuted, but they'd get a little shock and then not come back. Um, that's the, the extreme option. Hopefully you've tried everything else first. Um, so that's bear. And I would also, we're going to send you in your resources in the follow-up email. We'll have a link to um, the Fish and Wildlife has an article about composting in bear country. It's really worth the read. Um, so, you know, and that's, everyone talks about bear, but more likely is going to be rodents or skunk or something like that, that might be interested in your bin. So everything we talked about around Brown's using three to one browns, quarter inch hardware cloth, all of that is important to keep smaller mammals out. But sometimes you might need to take another step. Um, and there's some people will use predator urine, um, like coyote urine or human urine. You could pee around your pile. Um, those are all things that will eventually wash away and you have to reapply. Um, this is not a uh, tested or I, I would say this is not a guarantee, but sometimes using like, if you can get bulk cayenne pepper, that chili pepper, something like that, sprinkling that around your bed as a, as a deterrent for a small mammal, it'll help, but it won't be the, if it's not, it can't be the only thing you do. Um, and then lastly, I would suggest uh, if you're interested in trying out like sprinkling predator urine, there is actually a website called predatorp.com. That's a thing. And you can buy predator pee from that website. Um, finally, I would like to add, uh, I hate to bring this up, but if you have rats getting in your bin, um, we would recommend that you stop adding to your bin for six months. Um, so if you live somewhere where there's rats or somehow they've breached your security system, 
you got to get all the food out of there and it's got to be for long enough that they don't come back. You can do all of these other things and traps and everything, but um, that's one thing that can be really problematic unless you just stop, come, come to a screeching halt, take a break, find a drop off site and come back to it in six months, reinforce your bin, reinforce your hardware cloth in the meantime. Um, okay, so that's all we got on animals. And I think it's time to move on to the longer Q&A session we promised you. All right. All right. So first question is about, um, someone says they have a load of white insects. They're not sure if it's from maggots. How do they prevent this and get rid of insects? White insects? So they, they're they flying. Maybe could we ask the person who asked the question to give a little more detail? Are they like flies or are they crawling maggot? Like it sounds like flies. It sounds like the maggots like maybe possibly hatched from, I think it's just a how to avoid insects in your compost question. Oh, browns. <laughs> yeah. Use enough browns. Yep. And just also one thing we didn't mention earlier, but uh, citrus and banana peels come preloaded with your fruit flies, maggots. Those are, that's, you know, it's a gross fact of life, but um, they're already in the peels. So if you eat a lot of citrus or banana peels, you might see a little bit more of that kind of thing. And you just, you know, get it outside and cover it with browns as soon as you can. And generally speaking, a lot of questions. bugs okay. are not an issue in your compost. They are eating the food scraps, breaking them down, and that's all part of what composting is. So um, if you're grossed out by it, just cover it up with wood shavings. You know, a load of questions about whether or not you can put um, chicken waste in it or wood shavings that we're bedding for chicken waste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I can talk about that. So, uh, so the chicken waste, the manure from chickens is going to be a green manure that's going to be pretty high in nitrogen. But since it's uh, apparently also mixed up with these wood shavings, uh, that should be fine. The one thing you want to do is just make sure that you let it go long enough that it breaks down all the way. Make sure that um, you know when you when you want to use it, um, you're not able to see anything that looks like chicken manure or or anything besides dirt. Um, you know when it's fully processed, it's going to look like that rich loamy earth um, that you saw in that picture of the person holding it in their hands. That's finished compost. Um, and if you're if you're using raw manure like that, let it go at least a year to fully process. The other thing about uh, composting manure is usually the volume is really big. So like for chicken manure, that's a green, that's a high nitrogen. It's higher nitrogen than most other manures. So even with bedding mixed in, it may, you know, you may want to uh, add some of it to your compost pile, but you're still going to need to do the three to one browns to greens. So it's almost makes more sense to just do that separate. Okay. And we had a question that's kind of along those lines, which is, can you compost cat litter or do you need a green cone? Don't want to put cat litter in a green cone. It's a brown, whether it's clay or cedar, whatever you're using, that's a, and green cones are the exception. They're not compost, they're digesters. Um, so you could, you could take the clumps out and compost the poop and the pea clumps, but the actual litter should be, you can compost it, if it's clay, it's not really composting, but you can create a spot if you have enough space in your yard. Just keep it at least 100 feet away from any edible plantings you have. All right, and then we had a question. Um, I have a few bags of unused wood pellets. Can they be composted? I'll take them. <laughs> If you have a few bags of wood pellets, yeah, they can be composted, but maybe you could post on Front Porch Forum and see if anyone wants them first. Okay. Theron, do you have anything to add to that? Nope, that's a, that's a perfectly fine brown source. Um, yeah. All right. Do you stir your compost when it's resting? I, I don't know. I, I guess let's, let's both answer it. I would say depends. Um, mostly I don't, but if like every now and then I'll sort of peek in there and if I still see like 
you know, I can still see like whole leaves or something that's not all the way broken down. Sometimes I will do, uh, you know, a once over turnover just to make sure I've mixed in everything and give it one more final aeration. Yeah, it's, I, I agree. I'd say you definitely can if you want to, but it's not as important as uh, earlier on in the process. The idea of mixing it is you want to, you know, the stuff in the middle is going to break down faster. And so kind of want to move the stuff from the top and the outside into the middle and, um, and give it all a chance to break down. We had a lot of questions about vermicolor composting and also whether or not you should add earthworms to your compost. Worm questions. So vermicomposting, was it like how to or what? Um, was it? it was just kind of a what do you think of indoor ver vermicomposting? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great. I We used to include that in our like compost systems in that big like long section in the middle and took it out because it was, uh, it it's, Essentially, it's a really cool thing, but it's very unusual that you have a, a, such a big vermiculture uh, composting system that you can handle all your food scraps in it. So it's usually like an add-on thing. Worm castings are like magic in your garden or your plants. They, you only need a little sprinkle of them and they do wonders. Um, so yeah, I would say if you're interested in it, do it. Just I, it's you'd have to have a pretty significant sized system for it to be able to address most, all of your food scraps in a household. And um, for the person who asked if they should add worms to their compost, there's no need. Um, your compost should, or your compost system should have access to the soil directly. Um, and even if it's through hardware cloth, the worms will still be able to get in and they'll be interested in, in coming in and, and eating those food scraps. So. Um, so don't worry about the worms. If you want to add them, that's fine, but you don't need to. We had a couple questions about building a two or three big bin unit, um, whether or not you should use pressure treated lumber or not, those kinds of questions. I can take that one if you like. Uh, pressure treated lumber, hard no. That is treated with poisonous stuff that will leach into the soil and, um, and you don't want that. Um, the pressure treating, uh, it's, it's treated with arsenic and some other chemicals and um, yeah, definitely avoid that, um, especially with your compost bin. And if you're gonna be you know, growing food that you're gonna eat with it, you don't want that. Um, a better alternative would be some sort of naturally rot resistant wood like hemlock or cedar. Um, you could also, I mean, you could, you could use any kind of wood that you have, but um, but just look for a, a, a more rot resistant one. You could also add a, a weather coating, um, something to help it help preserve the wood. But again, uh, with that, I would, I would try to find something that's um, natural, something like um, that's, that's oil based or, uh, or like a, a whey based product, something like that, uh, that you can get from Vermont natural coatings or, um, or just some sort of raw oil. And then we had one question just along that, which is um, how long would it take for it be, to be finished in a tube-in system? For the compost to be finished? Yeah, the compost to be finished. Well, regardless of what system you have, um, it totally depends on how you manage it. So um, for most of us, it might take six months or a year to go from food scraps to finished compost. Um, if you are really involved and you're turning it regularly, um, it's going to be closer to six months. And we had more questions about animal waste, um, sheep waste, duck waste, and then pet waste. We're all questions. Can you say, read some of those questions? Yeah, it was just, um, let me find it. It was, um, I have chickens and ducks. Are their poop the same? Um, can I use bedding from sheep? Um, can dog and cat waste be composted? How long do you need to let it compost in order to be safe? So, Theron, do you want to take the the domestic, uh, like sheep? Yeah. Oh, or, sure. You do the dog and cat, and I'll. I was going to yeah. do it the other way, but whatever. <laughs> you yeah, do the ahead. dog and the cat. I'll do the duck, sheep, chicken. How's that? Okay, sounds good. You want me to start? Sure. All right, dog and cat. Um, 
you can you can put both of those things in a green cone, um, but you would not want to use those. Uh, you wouldn't want to compost them and use them on your on your garden or anything that you're going to eat. Um, the the poop from those animals uh, often has pathogens, and um, and it's it's just nasty. You're not going to want to have that anywhere near your garden. Um, you can you can yeah you can compost it I suppose, uh, but like Cassandra said, make sure it's like a hundred feet away from anything that you're going to eat. Yeah, and uh, sometimes people will just kind of make like a, a not a green cone, but the same concept. They'll just dig a hole in the ground and add it and then fill the hole in and then it's part of your yard again and it's kind of you know not bad for the soil it's good for the soil but it's just you those pathogens aren't going to go away um uh, for a long time so, kind of like a, a pit latrine right yeah that's that's more like it so um duck and chick all manures have different um you know like ratios of nitrogens and carbons and all that um i don't know them exactly but duck manure is probably a little more like chicken manure i think it's even more liquidy i had ducks for a little while and that was like liquid <laughs> i don't know the person asking i would say treat it just like any manure is a i'm sorry i'm plugging in my computer any manure is going to be high nitrogen and you might want to think about it in terms of uh, that ratio, three to one. Um, so if you're going to uh, if you're going to compost your duck manure, just the same way you would any other green, make sure you have three times as many browns. Um, in terms of the sheep manure, I think that's a little drier, and the bedding. I it, some of this depends on the farmer and how much bedding they use. Like the goat farmer that I use for my bedding, she adds a lot of bedding, so it's really like hay. It's like, it's like hay and wood shavings and there's little pellets mixed in. So it's really a good brown. Um, it's, it's way more carbon than nitrogen. With a bigger animal like a sheep or an animal that has a you know, wetter, more nitrogen rich manure like a chicken or a duck, um, it might not work as a brown because it, it might be really wet. So that's getting a little outside home composting, but my recommendation in general, if you have these animals is to just have a separate manure composting system that that could be an open pile. That's less, the, the only reason we talked about closed pile was based around food scraps. And you could mix those together or use it in your garden later, but it's the volume is gonna be huge for a home composting system. We had a couple questions about trench composting. Can I just bury my compost in the garden? Yeah, definitely. That is, and that's funny. We used to have that trench composting slide in in here, and we're doing we we took it out mainly just because we we're trying to keep within our time frame. Um, but trench composting is a great way to compost in the spring and summer and fall. Um, you literally dig a trench, you put your food scraps directly into the soil, cover it up, and keep adding all the way down the trench, and you can plant right on top of it. You don't need to add browns. Just make sure you bury it deep enough and 18 inches to two feet is should be plenty deep. So the answer is a hearty yes and you can handle your meat scraps that way too. All right then a couple questions about composting um, not florist flowers but like flowers that you grow at home and house plants. Hmm. That, I don't see any problem with that. Um, yeah, it's the florist's flowers that you want to avoid, and that's because they're treated to, to uh, you know, maintain them. Um, if you're if you're growing plants or flowers or whatever at home, um, and you're not using pesticides or fungicides, you're just doing it organically. That's totally fine. Should you shred them up, and do they count as browns or greens? Well, uh, yes, you should shred everything up. Um, like I said, the surface area is important. If things are in smaller pieces, they'll break down quicker because they'll interact more. Um, and what was the other thing? If they're greens, I, yeah, probably. Uh, yeah, so that's um, they'd be greens if they're if they're fresh plants. I'm just gonna um, point out, guys, that it's now past. It's three thirty-four, so we're at the end of our time. Why don't we take two more questions and then we're going to log off. And I actually, I also want to let, there's 92 people left. Um, if you can hang on a few more minutes, 
you're going to get a survey pop up. We'd really appreciate it if you would fill out our post webinar survey, let us know how we did. It'll help us make things better for the next time. And if you live in our district and you fill out that survey, that's what makes you eligible to get a free soil saver, a free green cone. So let's do two more questions and then we're going to end the webinar. All right. So one question about um, putting tomatoes in compost with the seed seeds start germinating in your flower bed or your garden. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> they will. They'll germinate like weeds if you're not hot composting, which you probably aren't. Um, and that's totally your call. I like it. I like getting the volunteer squash and the tomatoes. Um, but if you if that's something you don't want to do, and I have them germinate in my flower garden too, I weed them out and sometimes I'll save one and grow it. Um, but the, yeah, it's kind of a your decision if that's something you want to live with or not. And then we had a question about compost starters. Are they any good? I'm not sure what a compost mean. starter is. There's, well, there's accelerator powder that comes with your green cone and that's like an enzyme that kind of kickstarts the process. And I've heard of compost starters that are similar. You should not need anything like that. So I know there's more questions, but we do need to honor our end time. And um, so I guess uh, if you have a burning question that we didn't answer, you can always email us you will get an email from us. And actually those emails go directly to me. Um, and so we'll do our best to answer your question. So thanks everybody for logging in today and for joining us for our first kickoff webinar in the two week long series. I hope you'll join us for uh, tomorrow. Amanda and I are gonna be doing a zero waste swap and shop. And then we've got a recycling webinar later. And then later next week, we have some really cool ones coming up. Visible mending, a recook cafe, and we're finishing it by um, partnering with a global fix-it cafe next Saturday. And we have a safer cleaning webinar next week too. I almost forgot. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Darren. Thanks All right. everyone. Goodbye everybody.